Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to this time of worship here at Black Mountain United Methodist Church. My name is Lauren Sims Salata. I am the pastor here at Black Mountain UMC, and I am joined this morning by Nora Mosry, Greg Tomlinson, and Lynn Deese. Um, and we are very excited to be leading worship and to be celebrating God together. Now, you may have gotten an email earlier this week about an upcoming opportunity, and I wanna take just a minute to talk with you about that. Um, starting in September, because I know how much we have desperately missed being with one another in person. Starting in September, Wednesdays at lunchtime, uh, we will be coming together outdoors for a short service of scripture and prayer. Um, this it will be a simple service um, and an opportunity for us to be physically present with one another. We invite you, we're going to be outdoors right near the um, playground, and we invite you to bring a, a camp chair or something like that. You can bring a blanket and sit down on the ground. Uh, you can even bring a picnic if you want um, and make a picnic out of it. And then when our, uh, our service is over, you will have an opportunity, if you so choose, to stick around um, and share a time of fellowship with other members of the congregation. Um, we will be practicing um, all the necessary precautions when we're together, so we uh, do ask you to maintain social distance. Uh, when you're sitting and standing, and also to wear a face covering so that we can continue in our effort to do no harm uh, to one another and to our community as a whole. But we hope that you will join us for that Wednesdays at noon starting on September 2nd. And now, as we come into this time of worship, I invite you to take uh, this time during the prelude to prepare your body, your mind, and your heart to praise God. Good morning. Will you please join me in our call to worship? We step off the streets, away from places of work, shopping malls, billboard, and news broadcast, to stand before the living God. Our help is in the name of the living God, maker of heaven and earth. 
We turn away from the world's patterns of power that too often hurt, trap, and swallow us up. We stand before our helper, the God of mercy, who rescues and renews us. We come to this time and place seeking the living God, maker of heaven and earth. We present ourselves to the living God, who is compassionate and merciful as a holy and living sacrifice. prayer of invocation. Almighty God, you are making all things new. A new heaven, a new earth, a new way of thinking, a new way of being. You are making all things new. No more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. You are making all things new. Renew our minds to renew the world by living out your commandment of love. You are making all things new. Amen. lesson this morning is coming from John chapter 13 verses 1 to 5 and then 12 to 15 and I'm reading from the Good News version. 
It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet drying them with the towel that was wrapped around his waist. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. May God add blessing to the reading of his word. And now, brothers and sisters, we come to the time of our morning prayer. And so I invite you to pray with me. God of extravagant generosity, you are help for the helpless and light in the darkness. You are hope for all who seek and the joy of all who find. In the face of a world that tries too hard to proclaim that there is not enough, you are persistent in offering abundance. You are our fortress, and you have become our salvation. Lord, we proclaim your care readily, and yet we confess that too often we fall into the delusion of scarcity. We look around and see danger and uncertainty and we seek to protect ourselves at all costs. We turn away from the need and the desperation around us in, make, in favor of making sure we have plenty. We are well versed in self-preservation, Lord God. And sometimes that instinct takes over before we even know what is happening. Forgive us, Lord, and free us for joyful obedience to you. In the face of need, help us to evaluate what we have to offer. In the face of risk, let us assess opportunity. Work within us that we might be constantly opening, opening to you, to one another, and to your good world. Open our hands and our hearts in a gesture of your generosity that in and through us, the world might see the transforming power of your love. As we look around, we surely see the need that surrounds us. And so instead of turning away, we gather up those needs and we bring them to you. Lord, we bring to you a world struggling in the throes of pandemic and pray for protection and the defeat of this virus. We lay before you medical professionals and caregivers of all kinds and seek your strength and perseverance for them. We lift up to you those who are dealing with COVID and with countless other illnesses and injuries, those near to this church family and those whose names and stories we may never know, and pray expectantly for your healing. We pray for the people and the land of California as they fight unimaginable wildfires. And we beg you to renew your creation and our stewardship of it. We pray for your church here and around the world as we seek to re-envision church in the face of a new world and a pandemic. Strengthen us for what lies ahead, Lord. 
Help us to live in your vision of the kingdom and to move forward in your bold generosity and reckless love. We pray all these things and the prayers that rest on each of our hearts in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our epistle lesson this morning comes from Romans, the 12th chapter. And the lesson today is actually the whole 12th chapter of Romans. So let us hear the word of God. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. No. If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of God for all people. Thanks be to God. Live in harmony with one another. As I studied and worked with this morning's scripture passage, that line from Paul kept jumping out at me. Live in harmony with one another. Now, as many of you know at this point, I have been involved in my share of musical performances and offerings. I love singing harmony. I enjoy making music as part of an ensemble. 
Now, for the last several years, a lot of the work that I have done has been as a soloist. But to be honest, I don't prefer to be the center of attention. I like blending my voice with others, creating a musical experience as part of a team. Now, in a lot of ways, solo singing is easier. As a soloist, I'm not accountable to anybody else. If I fail, if I mess up, I have only failed myself. And as the only voice, I don't have to depend upon others either. I don't have to be concerned about what some other voice might be up to while I'm over here doing my thing. In solo singing, there are fewer potential surprises. There are risks to singing harmony. Someone could have an emergency and have to bail out of the performance altogether. It has happened, trust me. In less dramatic ways, it happens too. Someone could count wrong. They could miss an entrance or cut off a phrase in a noticeably incorrect place. Someone could sing a wrong note and throw everybody else off. Amen to the choir people? Yes. It happens. That being said, singing in harmony with others also carries great reward. Together, your voices blend and, and interact in powerful ways. Together, you can create a feeling of peace or tension or suspense or exultation in a way that a single voice just can't convey on its own. Harmony makes for powerful, rich expressions of emotion and experience. Harmony is a provocative word for Paul to use in describing our life together. Because in harmony, you have all sorts of different voices singing or playing different notes, but they're all building and participating in the same chord. Out of many, one. A pluribus unum. Sound familiar? It is the motto, the aspiration of our national life, at least in theory. A celebration of unity in diversity. Live in harmony with one another. It's important to note that when we're singing in harmony, when we're trying to fashion one chord from many different voices, we have to attend to those who are around us at least as much as we attend to ourselves. We have to depend on them for support. Sometimes we need to hear their voice, their note, before we know what it is we're supposed to be doing. We gauge our volume and our phrasing by those around us. And when it really comes together, when it suddenly clicks, it's as if some new organism, some new body has been created. You actually feel what other people are feeling. You breathe precisely when and how others are breathing. You freely give yourself in service to this new body. It's an extraordinary feeling. Harmony, when it's done right, is bold. It's daring and it is profoundly generous. And it is the life to which Paul calls the church here in Romans 12, live in harmony with one another. Once upon a time, before COVID put an end to things like in-person conferences, I was back home uh, where at the place that one of my pastor mentors only half jokingly calls the promised land. I was back at Duke Divinity School and I was there for two days of continuing education. And I joined in this workshop in which we spent time examining scripture passages and blocking them out as if we were gonna present them as a play. Now, when I signed up for this workshop, 
I didn't realize this is what it was going to be about. And admittedly, when I found out, I did do a little bit of an eye roll um, about what we were going to be asked to do. But it turned out to be a really valuable experiment. Trying to stage the passage meant that you had to ask some different questions of it. Questions about character and motivation and how you actually visualized the author's written words. So as I was studying Romans 12, I tried it. And I was astounded by how often a physical representation of what Paul is saying involve the same sort of movement, a, a reaching out or a, a stepping toward someone else, offering oneself in service to another. Think about it. Paul starts this chapter by saying outright, offer your bodies to God as a living sacrifice. He goes on from there to talk about spiritual gifts and urges people to offer their spiritual gifts to one another and to God. He invites us to love one another. I couldn't think of a better physical representation of love than opening up to another person. He says, show honor to each other, serve the Lord, contribute to the needs of the saints, extend hospitality, bless others live in harmony. What the New Revised Standard Version translates as associate with the lowly. Some other translations actually read, give yourselves to humble tasks. Over and over again, Paul encourages us to give ourselves to others, to live in bold generosity, to live in harmony with one another. Now, I will not stand here and say that generosity is always the easy road. In fact, it is rarely the easiest path to take. The easiest path, the most instinctual, is self-preservation. Paul urges us to share our gifts precisely because it is easiest to hoard them or to use them for our own benefit. He spends time and ink telling us to outdo one another in showing honor because it feels more instinctual to just outdo one another. He calls us to extend hospitality to strangers precisely because he knows that our knee-jerk reaction is probably to shut them out and shut them down. And he commands us to bless instead of cursing our enemies. Because he knows that that pesky fight or flight instinct is gonna try to make us get back and get ahead. Self-preservation is an instinct. Almost all creatures share it. It's built into us. And as part of God's good creation, self-preservation is not inherently bad. Please hear me when I say that. Self-preservation is not inherently bad. When you are faced with the black bear or the rattlesnake out on the trail, I promise you it comes in really handy. That being said, the inclination to lock down and circle the wagons when faced with new people or new situations or new opportunities can be pretty limiting in the context of following Jesus Christ, who came so that any and all might be one, as he and the Father are one. Self-preservation as a, a, a structuring principle of our lives has a distinct disadvantage as far as faith is concerned. I read something not too long ago by the Reverend Barbara Brown Taylor and in it, she says this. She says, fear of death, which is the, the evolutionary kind of underpinning of self-preservation, right? Fear of death always turns into fear of life. 
into a stingy, cautious way of living that is not really living at all. Fear of death turns into fear of life. That's a harsh sentence for followers of Christ who came so that we might live abundantly. And how did Christ himself deal with the risks that come from bold, generous living? The Gospel of John, as we read earlier this morning, explains that at Jesus' final Passover meal, when he knew that his capture and his death were imminent, and that one of his own disciples would be the one to betray him, he gathered his friends around a table. He wrapped a towel around his waist like one of the servants, and he knelt down with a basin of water to wash the feet of his disciples. And when he had finished and joined them at the table, he commanded them to serve one another in the same sort of humble, compassionate way. And later that evening, as he watched his friend Judas flee from the table to betray him, he turned to those who remained. And what he says next is everything. Because he doesn't tell them to protect themselves. He doesn't tell them to watch around corners or to lock the door of the upper room for fear of an enemy. Instead, he calls them to a life of boldness. He says, love one another. Just as I have loved you, so you also must love one another. This is how everyone will know that you are my disciples, when you love one another. Love, Jesus said, would give his followers away. Why is that? It's certainly not because love is the easy path. Quite the contrary. It's because self-giving love in the face of that self-preservation instinct. Self-giving love attracts attention. And in the face of an every man and woman for themselves sort of world, generosity stands out. Bold and joyful exploration of the world's diversity is vividly colorful, standing next to the drabness of cautious, stingy living. Love one another. Live in harmony with one another. Paul closes this 12th chapter of Romans with a statement as clear and as cutting as diamond. He says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Notice that he does not deny the existence of evil. He doesn't downplay the risks of living boldly and generously. <coughs> he just insists that it is, in fact, our sacred calling. Because when God came to defeat evil, it wasn't achieved by using an even greater evil. That never works. It was done using the surprising and initially counterintuitive weapons of love. A love so determined, so reckless, that even the grave could not contain it. <coughs> the one who loved boldly and genuinely even those who might wish him harm rose from the dead, came back to his disciples, and said this. This is the key. This is how the world changes once and for all. This is how evil meets its end. Love one another. Love one another. No matter how someone looks or speaks or smells or eats or gestures or worships or loves or votes, love one another. I promise you, it will turn heads and change lives. 
To the degree that we do this, to the degree that we follow this command of our Lord Jesus Christ, the music we make will shake the world to its very core. And so Christ calls us again. Live in harmony. Love one another. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
harmony with one another. Love one another. The Lord certainly doesn't prom promise us that that will be easy. But he does insist that that is the way the kingdom comes. That is the way the world changes. And he assures us of one more thing. That he is with us. In all that we do, in all that we say, as we go about it. And so, brothers and sisters, as we go from this place, may we love one another and love God's good world with all that we have. Amen. Amen.